going to tag team it a little bit tonight. Brian and I work together in Cyber Lab, and as part of the mobile club, I have a slightly less illustrious CV. My background is in the mobile industry, working with mobile technologies. Um, was working together with Brian at Imperial College, helping to launch the Mobile Application Center, which is applying mobile technologies in interesting areas like science, which led us to the Citizen Cyber Lab. Just to get us a little bit warmed up, can anybody tell me if they've heard of the term citizen science before? Citizen science, anybody? Anybody remember study at home? Ever have SETI at home running on your computer? Well, it's volunteer computing, so you personally were not so involved with You're that. You're too had... young for that. Oh, I'm showing my age. <laughs> Anybody here watch BBC Star at Sky at Night, Stargazing Live? How to play with anything on the Zooniverse? Have you heard about the opportunity to do a bit of andro uh, um, asteroid hunting? Do a bit of asteroid hunting in your spare time when you need a break from studies? Well, these are all in the fields of citizen science. We're going to tell you uh, what we're doing at the Citizen Cyber Lab in citizen science and, and all of the projects and tools and platforms we're building as part of the Citizen Cyber Lab. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I uh, uh, looked at the posters uh, that you guys have done. Those posters are from people in the audience. Uh, yes, and it, it seems to me in the CDTs you're doing uh, mainly basic science, what I describe as basic research, fundamental research. What we're going to be talking about today is not even applied science, it's very applied science. It's about uh, people who are not scientists working with science, uh, scientists to do projects that are uh, uh, of uh, interest to the citizens as well as the scientists. So. Started. Uh, how did citizen science get started? There are really three ingredients if you want to do citizen science. One is ubiquity, the other is uh, reuse or remixing, uh, and the third one, most important one, is uh, cognitive surplus, a term uh, coined by Clay Sharkey uh, to describe what we do in the post uh, three channel TV world in a lot of spare time. So, ubiquity, what is ubiquity about? Well, it's really about personal devices. Uh, the phone has evolved from you know, a tin can uh, through a thing with lots of buttons that had to be on a desk or on a wall. It was liberated from the wall. It got smart so that you could have uh, the internet on it, and now it's smart and there are no uh, buttons on a lot of them, meaning that you can program the whole device from uh, uh, remotely. You're not on. Uh, so the other thing about ubiquity, I, do any of you recognize this uh, uh, thing? Yeah, it's a Maslow uh, meme, and it, it's used a lot in business school to show you know, the various degrees of need in uh, human beings. Someone has just written Wi-Fi as the most basic need So the, on the bottom. And it, it really is, you know, makes the point, the other ingredient in ubiquity is that your device can connect wherever you are. So now you have uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, over a billion devices all connected. Uh, the dark side of ubiquity is that people use it for lots of meaningless data. So uh, the signal to noise ratio is very poor in uh, the uh, internet world. Uh, so that is a challenge. And that is also a challenge for citizen science. Uh, the the other key thing for citizen science is the way in which technology moves from the lab and the scientists to the citizen. And it's a phenomenon that I call remixing, but it's really a phenomenon that you find across the sciences. It's been going on for a long time. The basic structure of it is uh, you take an imperative procedure, uh, recipe list, and you turn it into a reusable building block by various techniques, pulling parameters out, that kind of thing. Uh, so in computer science, we would call these first-order functions, but they're also, to an older generation, macros. They're scripting, and there are many examples in science. Uh, you know, uh, I, physics, the physicists here, the discovery of uh, 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 Gauss's uh, Gregian theorema, the discovery that you can express any curve on a manifold with uh, three numbers, 
is uh, a great example in math of this kind of uh, reusability and translating into another field, which opens it up for another kind of science. In that case, it was physics. It allows you to share solutions, and it increases the intelligent behavior across users so that users who know nothing about what's inside the building block can be, become creative about it. The one uh, real drawback of a lot of these methods is that they're unstable. You get too much remixing, what's underneath stops working eventually, you have to go back and refactor it. It's a very important part, in the uh, part of the development cycle of citizen science. But they're extremely powerful because they enable people to do creative things that they weren't able to do before. Just to give you two examples, this is, people recognize this? Anyone? Someone must recognize this. This is GarageBand, which is the Apple Composer app, and it's on uh, an iPad. And the version on the iPad allows you to compose music knowing nothing about notes. Uh, you don't know, have to know anything about music transcription. You use... Uh, uh, tracks, uh, pre-recorded -pre tracks, you can put in all the chord structure, and it's absolutely amazing what kids who know nothing about music can do with this. Uh, another one, which it, uh, someone here has heard of BioBricks. This is synthetic biology. So it's basically uh, using pieces of DNA to uh, program uh, 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 single-cell organisms. And what they're doing here is identifying functionality in uh, pieces of DNA and making a kind of library of, of uh, 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 building blocks out of it. So you can make things like uh, there's a project in California to make fluorescent trees to light cities. Uh, and then we come to cognitive surplus, uh, which is uh, the amount of free time people have to do all these things up here. Uh, they're not sitting in front of the, uh, the tube anymore. They're uh, doing uh, faces and uh, selfies and uh, uh, Skyping and whatever now. And some of that is done uh, with citizen science. So a, a trillion hours of free time is up for grabs each year. And scientists in the last five years have realized this, so they're going out and trying to uh, access that. So... Uh, Citizen science is what we're doing at Citizen Cyber Lab, and I'm just going to do a quick history. So in the beginning, citizen science started way before computers or even before modern uh, you know, qualifications, uh, PhD-type uh, science. This is Charles Darwin. He was just a citizen, uh, signed up for uh, exploration uh, as a passenger on the Beagle, made notes. Uh, and before computers, uh, people... Uh, observed uh, 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 bird uh, migrations and wrote the stuff on uh, typed out and sent it in to, uh, to universities to be cataloged. And that's been going on for many, many years. Uh, the British uh, Astronomical uh, Association has had amateur astronomers contributing for about 100 years now, following comets and variable uh, stars and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's been very effective. Uh, and this is an, an, another example of the ornithology uh, uh, a bird count being continued into the Internet age. And Nestwatch is another one where they've made a transition to the Internet age. But today, citizen science is this. Someone recognize this. This is the CMS experiment at CERN. And so it's a huge uh, muon detectors there. And you can run the simulations for this now on your, your home computer. And in Citizen CyberWeb, we're building a game to allow you to do it interactively so you can tune the uh, uh, CMS at home. Uh, so, right. So when the Internet gets there, SETI at Home is one of the first ones to do uh, citizen science. Uh, and uh, Galaxy Zoo was the first one to do crowdsourcing very very effective uh, identifying galaxies. This was just a graduate student who has was faced with several million identifications he had to do. He said, I'll just put it out on the internet. And uh, within a day, the servers had crashed and there were thousands upon thousands of people uh, identifying galaxies. Uh, Folded is another one in biology you probably heard about, which uh, uses gamification and puzzle solving. And they've done some uh, amazing stuff with protein folding from ordinary citizens who don't know anything about uh, biology. 
so with personal devices, now we bring personal devices into the mix. This, uh, you're carrying your device around wherever you are. It has GPS. You can uh, take uh, a photograph or write a note about something you see and send it back to uh, uh, via the internet to a server. And this is there are now literally tens of thousands of these uh, projects all over the world, small and big, uh, for doing this. This is one that uh, we're uh, connected with at UCL. It helps uh, pygmies in the Central African Congo map uh, their boundaries. Uh, Jerome Lewis is the, the PI in this, and the challenge here is that there is no internet signal, and they, these people are m mostly uh, non-literate. So you have to come up with a way for them to identify uh, significant landmarks without literacy, and then they, a way for them to get the information back to uh, the, uh, the internet. And they have developed a tool suite at Imperial uh, sorry, at, at UCL called um, uh, Sapelli, which uh, allows you to construct these, these uh, diagrams you see there in the lower left-hand corner to, uh, to allow people to enter the information without knowing, uh, being able to read or write. Okay, so now we come to uh, uh, what we're doing in Citizen Cyber Lab. We are looking at supporting the learning and creativity in citizen science. And that means uh, the, of the three uh, ingredients, we're emphasizing the remixing ingredient, the idea that citizens can come up with solutions and then publish them, and other citizens can use them. So you build up uh, the experiment or the set of experiments using these building blocks. That's our uh, uh, URL. Uh, anyone wants to. These are on SlideShare, so if you want to uh, get to us on your mobile device that way. Uh, these are the partners. Uh, it's uh, CERN, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research, Imperial College. There are two partners here, uh, my old lab uh, in computing and one in medicine. It, the Excite Center at UCL, us, the Mobile Collective, and the University of Geneva, and uh, the UN, which is not up here, but is also part of this. Uh, the um, subjects that we're looking at are physics, biology, and uh, what you could loosely call geography. That is uh, geo-specific information. Uh, we're building three platforms. One is a, an open community mapping platform, and that's what's going to be behind this, and it's a generalization of this system. Uh, the idea is uh, to... Uh, gather, share, and visualize local knowledge, that knowledge that is of importance to a local community, and uh, to uh, publish and reuse visualization. So a lot of the, uh, uh, the problem with scientists interacting with local communities uh, and having an impact has to do with figuring out what it is the local community wants to do. And what the people at Excites at UCL have found is if you enable the local community with technology, they'll figure it out on their own, and they'll come up with visualizations that are more powerful than what a scientist advising them can do. So what we want to do is give them the, the power to come up with visualizations on their own. And this, uh, uh, the key element in this uh, platform is remixing visualizations. It's just in the first, uh, we've just had the first release of this. It's going to be a while before it's publicly available. But you can find it on GitHub if you're curious. Uh, the second thing we're doing is a uh, platform for building games and remixing games. And so the idea is a lot of this uh, citizen science stuff can be, uh, uh, you can engage the public by uh, making it into a game. There are a lot of gamers who are very interested in this. In this, uh, The people in Paris at the Cree have uh, built a platform for designing your own game, publishing it, and allowing people to take your game and, and remix it. Uh, an obvious uh, problem with this is if there's too many uh, remixings, the game stops working. But that, you know, that's one of the problems with this reuse thing that we'll have to tackle eventually. Uh, so, yeah, so create and share games and track user behavior. 
you can find more uh, uh, find out more about it there. Uh, that's the Redwire guys at the last hackathon we held at, at UCL, uh, and they hacked up this uh, computer shoot. So you shoot computers and win PhDs. Uh, <laughs> some guy came along, decided he wanted to uh, do this thing. So, uh, it's another look at the uh, the IDE. Uh, and now we come to the project that uh, the Department of Computing is doing here. It's called Citizen Grid. And uh, the idea of Citizen Grid is to make uh, distributed computing available to everyone. At the moment, uh, eScience runs on grids. Uh, you have to belong to a university to use any of the more complicated, more uh, computationally intensive tools, fluid dynamics, things, uh, um, uh, collision uh, simulators, you can't just run at home. Uh, we want to make this available to everyone so that people who are not scientists can design experiments and run them. So uh, the people in, in the Department of Computing are working on a thing called Citizen Grid, which uses the open virtualization format to allow you to publish an application server client or peer-to-peer -peer without caring about what's going to run it. So you publish it, and it can be a mix of people downloading uh, the app and running it on their computers, so-called volunteer computing, and uh, cloud computing, Amazon, and uh, grid computing in universities. Uh, so, and, and I think this is, this is, for me, the most interesting part of the project, if it, uh, if it succeeds. Uh, so in addition to the platforms, we're doing a number of pilots. One is the CERN Virtual Atom Smasher, which I've already mentioned. You will be able to... Uh, do tunings for CERN, which they, and if your tunings are good for the CMS, they will actually use them. So this is not just a, a toy to be used at home. They, they actually plan to use good tunings, and people will get, you know, points and that kind of thing. So it's very interesting. And they're not trying to hide the physics. The, uh, I had a, uh, a graduate student do the first version of this. And for the first version, we just put up all the parameters, whether... Uh, people could understand them or not. So it's also a way to get into the physics behind the thing. Uh, and they'll be coming out with the uh, first version of this in a couple months. It'll be online publicly available, but you can find the code there if you're interested. Uh, and then finally, there's Geotag X, which is from uh, UNITAR at the UN. It's a disaster mapping uh, application. And what this does is it allows people to search through photographs on Flickr and on news feeds and help out with uh, local responses to disasters. So if there are floods someplace, they, uh, the UN uses satellite imagery, but it's not enough information. So people can go uh, to this app and then uh, it will collect information from news feeds, possibly relevant, and ask you questions about it. And the idea is to improve the kind of response uh, that the uh, um, NGOs uh, have for uh, uh, disaster relief. Okay, uh, uh, and then one more thing. The, at the, in Paris, they've designed a synthetic biology game, which is another of our pilots. And it basically is a game which takes a small bacterium and uh, it's... Uh, 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 robot companion through uh, an organism and you gather, you turn into a superbug, basically. Uh, gathering uh, immunity and that kind of thing. Uh, they say balance, but it really is uh, a superbug situation. Uh, and, and they've done a wonderful job with this, and this you can uh, play online now. And here's my project. This is what I'm going to be doing. This is where I will be in a month. These are uh, Inupiaq uh, whale hunters in the top, who live in the top of Alaska. Uh, and I'm working with a researcher at UCL uh, to teach them how to hack uh, Arduino boards. Uh, I don't know if you guys... Ooh, it works. I don't know if you guys know about Arduino boards, uh, but I brought one along here to show you. It's a small microcontroller, 8-bit microcontroller. 
uh, wired up to a bag, uh, to a board uh, used for prototyping. And this is a little thing I did for the Science Museum Lates, where I wired up a breathalyzer, a cheap breathalyzer. It uses tin dioxide and a resistor. Uh, it's very inaccurate to see if you've been drinking or if you're emitting methane. You can't distinguish. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it was actually pretty popular at Science Museum Lates. And this is the board here. And what I will be doing up there is teaching uh, the uh, high school students to hack this. There, as far as the researcher who's working with me knows, there is no uh, clear use of this with any cheap sensor for helping these people uh, detect climate change. What they're mainly interested in is ice thickness. Uh, they get stuck out on the ice more and more because of uh, uh, climate change. We like to give them a way of doing that, but what we're going to do is take use the principle they use at Excites that you enable people to do the technology first, uh, show them the basics, and then they go and they develop it on their own, and we'll see what they come up with. We're working with the people at the Jet Propulsion Labs as well. They would like scientifically reliable data. This will not give it to you at 20 below. So uh, we're not really sure what how that will play out. And then, there it is again. And then finally, we're building uh, a, a generalized tool for uh, doing any kind of uh, um, uh, programming of personal devices. This is called EpiCollect. It's done in the School of Medicine. It was designed originally for epidemiology, but it's uh, used now in many projects all over the world. We're doing an HTML5 version of it that will allow you to run it on any phone. It's the basic idea is you create a survey uh, and you put it out. And people look at it on their phones, you know, is this uh, uh, a plant? What is color is it? And they take a picture and send the picture back with the survey. And it's used a lot in Africa now by uh, in veterinary situations where there is uh, no easy way of uh, collecting data. Uh, so this is the tool, right? So it shows you uh, all the places EpiCollect is now used and the kind of thing it's used for. You can see some of the state picture up there. Uh, and finally, with all these things, we are doing evaluation. How much do people learn? How creative are they? Uh, people at the... Uh, uh, University of Geneva have uh, come up with a very clever learning cube that I have to be uh, instructed in to understand. So I, I would be at the very bottom of this uh, learning cube. But the basic idea of this is to get not just the traditional learning, not how much science do people learn, but how creative are they with the science that they can use in these projects. That's for us, is the most important part of this. Now I'm going to turn the forward to Margaret who's going to talk about what our company does, the Mobile Collective. We do hackathons. I quit my job in Imperial College so I could hack all the time, not just half the time. <laughs> and, uh, and I do that with Morgan. Right, so, uh, so Brian and I met because I have a background in running hack days. And the hack days are this fan uh, fantastic um, coming together of people to just have a play with all the cool tools that are out there, new things, have, have a go, what happens if you do this with that, what happens if you mash this data up with this piece of hardware, what can I do with this new operating system, what does this API open up, and just have a lot of creative fun. Um, hacking, in this sense, means coming up with something on the fly, put it, putting it together on the fly, and just being creative. So that's something that we do at the Mobile Collective, and in, the, in this case, we're applying it to DIY science, hacking for science. And the whole point of Citizen Cyber Lab is not to be doing classical top-down science that then informs people in a press release at the end of the day, here's this brilliant discovery we've made. It's putting stuff out there for people to do science with and to create their own science, build their own science with. So we're taking all of the ethos of the hack day, the maker fair, the maker movement, um, DIY movement, and bringing it right into science so people are not only getting involved in citizen science projects with some of their spare time, um, and smashing a few atoms and playing and playing with playing with the numbers, but actually doing their own science in their own backyard. There's a number of examples of people that are already doing this around device 
hardware hacking, coming up with their own devices. So we've got some examples here of, um, at the bottom left-hand corner, that's a Geiger, if I remember correctly, that one's a Geiger counter. Um, the one on the, the bottom right-hand corner is the Air Quality Egg, which was launched on, on Kickstarter. Top left-hand corner is the Public Labs, which is, is very involved in creating their own devices. For example, this balloon mapping kit, which they were able to launch on Kickstarter very successfully. You can buy it now on the Public Labs website, and you can do your own balloon mapping. And they've used it in a number of amazing scenarios, such as, um, such as oil spills off of off of the coast of the states where people were really frustrated by the slow response of official governmental bodies. They went out, they did all of the balloon, they did all of the mapping themselves, taking very, very detailed photographs, brought it back and were able to, to get action, were able to get much more relief effort focused on their area, more money, more time, and more of the official organizations put behind it. So there's a, there's a civic movement element to citizen science. This is um, after the earthquake in Japan when the nuclear disaster hit and there was radiation in the, uh, in the environment. The Japanese government did a very typical control the information response and very little data was being publicly released about how safe it was, where the radiation levels were in various areas. And very quickly people started put, sticking up on instructables, ways to hack together their own ra um, radioactivity, radioactivity meters. So take, hack together your own Geiger counter kind of thing. Not super robust, but enough information to map these kinds of maps. And this was also the effort of a group of web developers. They put up a website called SafeCast that had um, loads of ways for you to upload data to it and map it. And it gave a very, very detailed real-time information about what was happening in, in immediate neighborhoods, even being able to follow roads and seeing, don't follow that road further, take it off in this direction. And it, turned, it became the go-to source of information. And it was completely volunteer effort. It was a mix of hardware hackers and website hackers and, and people just doing stuff for themselves. Uh, so it's not the old sense of hacking, it's the new sense of hacking. This is, um, this is a fellow out at Over the Air, which is a mobile developer event that are organized. So you might recognize this meme from the phone hacking scandals, which was not actually phone hacking, it was voicemail hacking. So that's his particular protest. But the point is the creativity that comes into it. So this is an example of a DIY science that we did it over the year. We had a citizen science theme where we inspired people to build stuff for science, do your own science. And um, so we wanted to build, build his own, build his own air quality measurement device that could go on his bike and he would, could map the air quality of all of the routes that he regularly biked along, and he mapped it and against time and place so that he could see how, how he was exposing himself to exhaust fumes, for example, on, reg, on his regular routes. Instead of mapping it, he did it for himself. Yes, and just to add one note to that, the idea of this is, is this is really a crowdsourcing app. So if he, as he pointed out in his talk, if he just did it himself, the information is not too reliable because, first of all, that air quality egg is another one of these cheap sensors. And you can calibrate it, but it will, the calibration will be meaningless as soon as you move, you know, a couple degrees up or down. So it's, uh, it is not enough information coming from the device to do it. So what his idea was you had lots of people on bikes going through it, lots of different readings, different times a day. You could kind of get an average idea that would not be way off. So, but it relies on the idea that many, many people are doing. And then the open mapping tools that we're building would enable you to create any kind of a map where you're sharing some similar data with a large group of people. Uh, we've, as a Citizen Cyber Lab, part of the whole point for us is to get this stuff out in front of people, not only to invite them to come and, and do our pilot projects by volunteering a little bit of their time, but opening up this whole idea of you can build stuff for science, you can hack for science. So we went out to the Science Museum at the Lates last month. They had a Make, Hack, Do theme. Highly recommend getting out to the Science Museum Lates, by the way. Lots of cool people showing lots of cool projects you can have a bit of fun and get a bit hands-on with. Um, we showed people the, uh, the hardware hacking that uh, with, we want to do up in Barrow, Alaska with, the, with a group of Inupiat um, hunter-gatherers, but also just to give a sense of what can you do if you, with all of these new sensor tools. There's all these open sensors. You can plug it into an Arduino board, into a Raspberry Pi, and there's all sorts of cool stuff that you can start doing right in your own backyard, your school, your community, etc. 
And uh, this was probably the number one thing that people engaged with. Uh, blinking lights and breathalyzers help, of course. But, uh, but people love this idea that you can get hands-on and you can do science. So one of the things we'd like you to invite you to think about with your own research is what are the elements you can throw open to people and get them involved, not just with what are small tasks in the vast amounts of data that you're collecting or the vast amounts of data that you require that you can get people involved in because they're fascinated in the science and, and love the idea of helping out. But what can you put in people's hands to do their own science? Yes, yeah, so uh, just to return to the, the remix theme, you know, if you all think about what, how can you take your fundamental research that you're doing and put it in some kind of reusable container that someone who knows uh, nothing about the mechanics of what you do but uh, knows about how they would like to apply it, can use. So how can you do that? It's like creating a track in, a uh, music track in, in iPad, uh, that, that kind of idea. Yeah, exactly. And we'd like to hear from you if you want to do that and participate in our, our hack days. So we've got, we've got a, a wide range of events that we're involved in. And we, um, we're always looking for interns, by the way, if anybody's really keen on doing a bit of hands-on science with people, getting a feel for public engagement, uh, science communications, how people find a way into science when they're not trained scientists, just have a fascination or a curiosity, and how you give them, give them something to have a little bit of a play with, get a sense of it, and then through that draw them into something quite deeper. Because we often in science have these amazing ha. Uh, uh, turnaround points that are very hard to explain just why that's such a big, big deal. But when you get people a bit more of the context and why this stuff is so cool, it's amazing how many people get excited by science that didn't think that they otherwise would. So we... Um, and at, just, just to add, if you're interested in uh, doing an internship with us or with Citizen Cyber Lab, we have mainly internships, summer or a few months. I'll, I'll leave these cards at the reception desk so you can pick one up and drop us yeah. an, an email. These are the ones we had out at the Science Museum late, so that'll take you to a mobile website with all the hacks we were showing off there, but you'll, it'll get you to us as well. Uh, so coming up this, at the end of the summer at CERN, we're having a, a, a CERN Summer Student Web Fest. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of particle physicists that come to CERN for the summer as part of their PhD program or wrapping up this program. And they're going to be doing, say, looking at, um, at getting people involved in science, doing science, doing citizen science. Um, at, we were out at the Mozilla Festival last year. We'll be out at the Mo Mozilla Festival again this coming year. They they've increasingly are doing an open science meme. Some of that's about open data, access to data, access to research. But it's also about applying their web maker tools so people do it making the web themselves. All these accessible, have some fun, be creative, and applying yeah. that to science. I really recommend uh, to all of you to get out to MozFest next year. I, you know, I've spent 30 years in computer science, and I learned more in that one day than I have 10 years at Imperial. It's absolutely amazing the kind of people go. Just to get a quick sense, how many of you are doing, are, are doing some programming in the context of, of your research? Uh -huh. yeah, awesome. <laughs> so we got some skills in the room. Yeah. How many of you have been getting into hardware hacking? Are you doing anything with building your own devices? Yeah. Yeah, so there's some hardware skills in the room too. And the beauty of all of this open stuff, all the time points out in terms of um, scientific calibration, they're not exact enough for, for very robust science, but the, the number, sheer number of things that you can do with a bit of imagination, with the kind of stuff that uh, these just, days. Just quick. It's not all open. It's not all open hardware. No, the chip, the Admel chip, has stuff in it that's they don't release information. Ah, it's just been col collected by people who use it. So. Okay. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Uh, so, the, the one that Brian mentioned uh, that's coming up, he's heading up to to Barrow, Alaska, to work with a group of uh, high school students and the local community to do a bit of hardware hacking, thinking in terms of what kind of science can they capture to help them measure what's happening in their immediate environment. There was a big icebreak event just this past just this past spring, where the longest piece of ice yet to break off of the shoreline broke off, and there was a team of hunters that were stuck out there for a week, stuck on a an escaped ice floe for a week before they could be rescued. It's it's the the changes in their environment are really quite severe, and the coolest part of it would be to put all of those tools in their hands. It's not only uh, being in charge of your own life and your own environment. But this, the skills that you gain when you've got a, that mix of hardware hacking, coding, science, that you're putting uh, you're aspiring high school kids or local community members to get involved in that, all sorts of stuff open up. 
Uh, we're also going to be doing a um, UNITAR disaster mapping challenge with the platform that, that UNITAR has built, Geotag X. So we'll be inviting people to get involved in the code. Uh, there'll be very specific challenges in the code, code sprint style to move some of the stuff forward, but also to come up with uh, new project ideas for new ways to use this mix of photos and taking a photo and, and, and tagging and identifying and asking questions to drill down into the really meaningful information underneath. And the, same, and the same web fest. So we do this as the Mobile Collective, which is a business that Brian and I started together, which is around creative collaboration. But it's where fields come together. So we're applying web technologies and mobile technology to science, and also in fields of science that are crossing, uh, crossing over, such as synthetic biology. There's all this brilliant stuff happening at the crossroads of fields where there's a lot of scope for creativity, and that's what we're, that's what we're tapping into. So also, if you're in the course of your own research, you see an opportunity to bring different fields together for a day of really intensively working together to move stuff forward, give us a shout, because we love doing stuff like that. And uh, we'd love to get you involved as interns, helping us do that kind of thing, if that, if that tickles your fancy. Um, and that's just This is the, the URL is possibly more useful in this format. But there's one after, there's a slide, yes. the final slide. So the, I put this slide up because I'm, I'm not only a computer scientist gone bad, I started out as a classicist, uh, and the hobby took over my life, and I just decided uh, to do computer science. And this is uh, the quote from Archimedes, and it really is the whole principle behind Citizen Cyber Lab. That's uh, ancient Greek. Dos moi pasto kai tan So from someone here must know who said this, yes. Archimedes, right? So give me a place to stand and I'll move the world. It's all about uh, reuse and remixing and just leverage something. Great. Okay. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. And, uh,